Have you ever thought about it? I mean, really. What is the purpose to life? Why are we here? Where did we come from? For that matter, where are we going to go when this life is over? Hmm. In this seminar, it talks about the age of the earth. Dr. Hoven gives solid evidence to show that this earth is not billions of years old. In fact, the evidence points towards a literal six-day creation, like told about in Genesis chapter 1. Hi, my name is Aaron, and we hope you enjoy this incredibly powerful seminar presented by Dr. Hoven. It's called The Age of the Earth. Well, it's an honor to be here tonight in Tennessee. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 16 years I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I tell people right up front that I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. I even believe the cover on mine. It says Kent Hovind. And for those that don't know, the Bible is your basic instructions before leaving earth. You really ought to read the book because you're going to be gone for an awfully long time. I mean, when you leave here, there ain't no coming back, so make sure you're going to the right spot. Okay, now, one of my jobs as a Christian is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in us. I think in the last few hundred years, the Christians have not done a good job of answering this evolution theory, and we've allowed this philosophy of evolution, actually it's a religion, we've allowed this religion to take over our school system, our legal system, our whole thinking process now is based on a philosophy which has zero scientific evidence, none. We've been offering a quarter million dollars for anybody with any real scientific ev evidence for evolution. That offer's been out there about 12 years now. There is no evidence for it whatsoever. People believe in it, I understand, but that doesn't make it science. Now, there are three things to try to accomplish in my seminar. Number one, I want to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Number two, if you're not saved, I want to try to get you converted. I'll tell you right up front, I'm after you, okay? I'm not sneaking up on you. I'm after you, all right? Number three, if you're saved and you're not doing much for the Lord, then I'm going to try to make you uncomfortable. All right, you know where we're going now. Okay, okay. this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. Last summer was our 31st anniversary, and we sat down and figured out how much money we have spent since we got married. We have spent all of it. We live in Pensacola, Florida. What's left of it, Hurricane Ivan about blew it off the map. <laughs> but uh, we're having a, we're a good time rebuilding down there. I have three children, one of each. And I got them all married off, and the dog died. So I made it. Praise God, I am home free. It is wonderful. And for those that don't know, we now have the whole family working in our ministry there. And I have four grandkids so far. And for those that don't understand this, grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. <laughs> How many have already figured that out? You've already met? Yeah, that's great, isn't it? All right. And all of them live right around me, and they all work in our ministry. They all want to serve God with their life. That's worth something to somebody. We have about 40 people in our ministry, and we want to do things that'll help strengthen your faith in God's Word. We want to change people's worldview. There are two ways to look at this world. That's called your worldview. How do you view this world? Some people look at the world one way, and some look at another way. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the way you view the world determines how you will answer the four great questions of life. There are four fundamental questions that every single religion on planet Earth tries to answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? when I die. The way you answer those questions is totally determined by your worldview. Some people look at the world and say, you know, it's amazing, a big bang made this from nothing. That's the humanist worldview based on the evolution theory. Other people look at the world and say, you know, there's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview based on creation. And those two worldviews are at war with each other. I mean, somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. I've done a lot of debates, over 90, 92 debates now I've done at universities. One here at UT Knoxville against Dr. Pigliucci. Debated him twice. I'd be glad to do it again. I don't think he will, but uh, I'd be honored. You know, the, the guys I debate are a lot smarter than I am. But I slaughter them because I'm right and they're wrong. You know, it's real simple. Real simple. But if the evolution theory is true, how would you answer the four great questions of life? Who am I and what am I worth? Well, if evolution is true, you're nothing important. You're just a piece of protoplasm that washed up on the beach. You're not worth a thing. Actually, you're part of the problem, you see, because you are one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can get rid of, the better. See, that's normal thinking if evolution is true. Where did I come from? Well, if evolution is true, you came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? 
Well, if evolution is true, there's no purpose to life, so you might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, if evolution is true, you're going to the grave, and you're going to get recycled into a worm or a plant. But see, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if that's true, that puts a whole different set of answers to those questions. That means we better try to figure out who God is and find out what He wants and do what He says, because He created this place, which means He owns it, which means He makes the rules. We better find out what He wants. And if you're not obeying His rules, you may be in trouble one of these days. We're going to get into more of that later. But boy, the devil doesn't like this idea that God created the earth. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The first thing he said to the woman, he said, Eve, hath God said? Yea, hath God said? He's, tr he's, he's trying to raise doubts about God's Word. Satan always tries to raise doubts about God's Word. That's one of the reasons we've got all this confusion on the different Bible versions. You know, where is God's Word? Is it over here? I don't know where it is. We cover more on that on video 7. The second thing he said to the woman, he said, ye shall not surely die. He's calling God a liar, basically. The third thing he said to Eve is what I want to talk to you about tonight. He said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. It started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to think you can become a god. Yes, boys and girls. We started like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. People ask me all the time, they say, Hoven, do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? I say, nope. I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> I didn't get to see a whole lot of it. Satan's a liar. He said, you can be like God. I'll tell you what, the Mormon church has swallowed that. They teach their people, if you're a good Mormon, when you go to heaven, you get to become God. And if you're a good Mormon wife, when you go to heaven, you get to be eternally pregnant, producing spirit babies. My wife don't want to go. She said, that's not heaven. <laughs> By the way, there are some great books to reach Mormons, and a good website, utlm, utahlighthousemission.org. If you want to reach Mormons, you ought to study that one. I was surprised to find out a couple years ago, some of the major Catholic theologians of the past have taught man can become God. It's still in their catechism right now. Now, most Catholics don't believe that, and they don't even realize some of their leaders have taught that. But even Kenneth Copeland said, Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. He said, you don't have a God in you. You are one. I'm sorry, Kenneth. You're crazy about that, okay? Kenneth Hagin said, the believers called Christ. That's who we are. We're Christ. No, you're crazy. The job's not available, and you couldn't do it if you had it, okay? You're not God, right? Nor are you Christ. Walk on water sometime. I want to see that. Lucifer is the one who wants to be God. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, Satan wants to be God. But the job's not available, so he's all upset about that, and he can't be God. So he lied to Eve and told her she could be like God. He, Satan hates us, though, because we're made in God's image. And boy, Eve fell for that hook, line, and sinker. Wow, I get to be God. Now, Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He said they're more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. If you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to do it like my two big brothers did to me. I have two older brothers. They've always been older than I am. They still are today, I believe. But when I was about six years old, I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois. By the way, I know I'm in Tennessee, but are there any more Yankees in the crowd? Any Yankees out there? Five, six, seven. Okay, and how many Southerners do we have? Ooh. Well, just remember who won, if you would. Uh, <laughs> I know, it ain't over yet. <laughs> but I was raised in East Peoria. I couldn't help that. But I did move to Florida as soon as I got smart enough to figure out, you know, the South is going to rise again. But... Uh, I was about six years old. I came running in for breakfast one morning, and I was the first one there for breakfast. So I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. Well, a few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. They said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. How many of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling you get when you finally pull one over on them? 
Boy, that morning I had them and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg little brothers for anything. They either beat them up and take it away by brute force, or they lie to them and trick them out of it somehow. So my brothers said, hey, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. I was only six years old. It's been proven in laboratory tests. The brain doesn't even start to grow till kids are 18 to 20. How many parents can verify that one from raising kids? Yep. I said, no, how are bananas made? And they said, well, down in South America, they have these spiders that live up in the trees, and when they die, all their legs fold up, and mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs. And a banana is really nothing but moldy spider legs. I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. They said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle, you can still see the black spots where his legs were. I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. <laughs> they lied to me. Have you ever been lied to before? You know, I would not have believed the lie if it hadn't been for those black spots. See, if you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to mix it with some truth. That's a technique they've used for years to kill rats. You don't give the rat a bowl of poison. You give the rat a bowl of good food with a little poison mixed in. They're mixing two things together that really do not belong together. See, rat poison is 99.995% good food. That's how you trick them. They've done the same thing for years to sell Marlboro cigarettes. They mix them in with cowboys. You can watch any Marlboro commercial. There's something about a cowboy in there. Have you stopped and thought about that? What is the connection between smoking Marlboro and cowboys? Do all cowboys smoke Marlboro? No. Do you have to smoke Marlboro to be a cowboy? No. If you start smoking Marlboro, do you become a cowboy automatically? No. You may smell like a horse, but you are not a cowboy. Okay? Actually, it's been proven in laboratory tests that nobody in the world smokes. Nobody smokes. Only the cigarette smokes. The person is the sucker. That's all. I think they ought to put the real name on those things. We ought to have some truth in advertising. You know, they should really be calling them cancerettes, breath rotters, bypass, malignant, phlegm balls, and money suckers. Mm -hmm. They do the same thing with beer, though. They try to associate beer with sports. What does beer have to do with sports? They get some big football player holding his can of Bud Dumber. Or Bud Stupid. They call it Bud Wiser. <laughs> it don't make him any wiser, that's for sure. He's got his Bud Dumber, Miller Low Life, or Dead Dog, whatever it is. He says, man, you drink this stuff and you will be a football player. Yeah, right. The Bible says, you drink that stuff, you will wreck your life. Who hath woe, who hath wounds without cause, they that tarry long at the wine. The Bible says, don't even look at it when it gets fermented. Habakkuk said, woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink. There's a lot in the Bible about don't even touch that stuff. One kid said, what's the matter, Hovind? Don't you like beer? I said, I don't know. I've never tasted it. I'm 52 years old, never had a drop in my life. Well, I've had NyQuil a couple times. but He said, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? I said, now, son, that's a brilliant way to live your life. Let me ask you a question, son. Have you ever laid your head under a semi-truck? Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? <laughs> you don't have to try everything to figure out if it's good or bad, okay? There are other ways to learn, you know, <laughs> like watching somebody else do it. Wow, don't do that. That will hurt, you know? Like famous redneck last words. Hey, y'all, watch this, you know. Uh. <laughs> I like science, folks. I collect science books, and there, there's a lot of good science in these books, but there's some poison mixed with it. It's kind of like the rat poison. It's not the good food I'm against. It's the poison. I need a boy and a girl who would like to learn the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. Who would like to learn? Okay, that boy right there. Come on up here. And one girl. Let's get one girl. Come on. Way back there. Okay, hurry. Run, 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 run. Let's go. The scientific way to shoot a rubber band. What's your name, sir? Josh. How old are you, Josh? I was 10 for a whole year one time. That's amazing. I was supposed to be 11, but I was sick for three years when I was two and a half. Okay. And how old are you going to be when you're almost 12? 11. And uh, how much does your mom pay you to be good? So you're good for nothing, and you're 10. Okay. Good. Pick a rubber band out of here, Josh. Okay, the brown one. And what's your name, ma'am? Laura. Pick a rubber band out of there, Laura. You want the pink one, of course. Oh, girl. Okay. Now, what I want you to do, Josh and Laura, oh, we're going to stand here and shoot the rubber band down the center aisle. Go ahead. Oh, that, that, that one won't work. That's a double one here. Let me try, try an orange one here. That's two tied together. I didn't see that. Okay, Josh, shoot the rubber band down the center aisle. Past the table. Not too far. 
Laura, give it a try. Come on. Ooh, three rows back. Now watch carefully. I'm going to get down the same size as you guys. And I'm going to show you the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. You ready for this? I want you to notice now, my fingers do not leave my hand at any time. <laughs> you believe that? Okay, now pay attention. You see the guy sitting in the way back of the church? Oh, about three-fourths of the way there. Now probably right about now you're thinking of a question that has uh, five words in it. What question are you thinking of? How do you do that? See, I told you it had five words in it, right? Now, before I show you how to do this, I want to explain something. Some kids should not learn how to do some things. Because they become what's known as a menace to society. <laughs> Who's responsible for this kid right here? Where's your mom and dad? Is he safe with this information? <laughs> mom says no. And who's, who's responsible for this one here? Where's Nobody? Oh, back there. Did your husband come? No. Okay, now pay attention. The scientific way to shoot a rubber band, okay? There are two sides to the rubber band. Are you with me so far? Okay. One side represents your flesh, that's your body, okay? The other side is your spirit. Now, your spirit has to live in your flesh or else you're dead. See, if your spirit ever leaves your flesh, you got a real problem on your hands. Actually, the neighbors do, okay? But what most people do wrong in rubber band shooting and in real life, they put the same emphasis on the flesh and the spirit. See, if you pull both sides the same and let it fly, if you could watch it in slow motion, the both sides are going... And all the energy is wasted inside the rubber band because the flesh and the spirit are fighting with each other. So... The secret to high-speed velocity through a fluid medium such as the atmosphere, which offers resistance, is to minimize or eliminate the turbulence. Okay? <laughs> All I did when you guys weren't watching was stretch one side tighter than the other. One side's tight. Now pay attention, okay? What's going to happen if you do it right? The spirit leads the flesh takes away most of the turbulence, and it goes much farther. Got the guy in the back row. So, when I'm up here with a whole pile of rubber bands, knowing I can hit anybody in the room, it gives you this feeling of power that some kids really just don't know how to handle. You know what I'm talking about? You're thinking about it right now, aren't you? Yes, I thought so. Let's give them a hand. Have a seat, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> The Bible says the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary. One to, this is why some of you are not going to go very far in your spiritual life. You feed the flesh too much. Shut off the TV once in a while. You know, simple. Okay? Wait till you see our super airplanes go. Tomorrow, we're going to show you our super airplanes. I make paper airplanes that go so far, if they don't land in a tree or on a building, they go all the way to the ground. Our record with a paper airplane is 450 feet. We're going to put them completely over the building, including the steeple, tomorrow. But we'll do that tomorrow. Okay. We like science. We're not against science. But I'm against poison mixed in with the science. That's all. Here's a first grade textbook. I'll show you what I'm talking about. They tell the kids in first grade, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. Now just hold on a minute. Is the Earth four and a half billion years old? No, as we'll see in a minute. But if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. First graders believe everything you tell them. They believe bananas are moldy spider legs. <laughs> I did. And then tell them again in second grade. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. Down at the bottom it says, life too has evolved on Earth. This word evolved is a very tricky word. I've done over 90 debates and about 7,000 radio and TV call-in talk shows, and I've learned how to win the debate on evolution in the first five minutes. It is so easy. If somebody says, do you believe in evolution? I say, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, evolution. No, which one are you talking about? There are six meanings to the word. Are you talking about cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter? I don't believe in that with the Big Bang. We'll talk about that in a minute. Are we talking about chemical evolution? Because according to the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang, you know, <clears throat> produced hydrogen and maybe some helium. Well, then how do we get all these other elements? You want me to believe uranium evolved from hydrogen? They'll say, well, you have fusion. You have fusion in stars. 
Yeah, but you can't fuse past iron very well. Number two, you've got a chicken and an egg problem here because you have to have the stars to make the elements and the elements to make the stars. Which one came first? Which brings up, of course, stellar evolution. How did the stars form? You know, nobody's ever seen a star form. Scientists don't even have a clue how a star could form. No even good theories about star formation. We cover more on that on video seven. But we see stars blow up all the time. It's called a nova or a supernova if it's a big one. Well, that happens all the time. But we never see one form. And yet there's enough stars out there that we know about that everybody on planet Earth, every single individual, can personally own 11 trillion stars to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> Fourthly, there's going to have to be organic evolution. Life has to get started from non-living material. Nobody has a clue how that could happen. Then we're going to have to have what's called macroevolution. That's where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. Did you know nobody has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog? Never. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog every time. And it could be that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. They probably did. But every five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind of animal. I'll show you. Is anybody in here five or six? Who's five or six years old? Anybody? How about, we got one? Oh, okay. How old are you, buddy? Six? I want you to take a test. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is different than the rest of them? The banana. Give him a hand. All right. Very good. Okay. We have college professors can't figure that out. Okay. Tell you what I want you to do. When we're done, I want you to go out to the table out in the hallway and you can pick out any free video or DVD you want. Okay? We've got a bunch of videos and DVDs about dinosaurs and stuff out there. The Bible says the animals are going to bring forth after their kind. Now, Charlie Darwin wrote a book on the table down here called Origin of Species. See, a dog and a wolf are the same kind of animal, but they're different species. He fooled everybody by changing the word from kind to species. We'll get into more of that on video four. Lastly, we have what is called microevolution. This is changes within the kinds. Now, that one happens. I'll go along with number six. I think animals can produce a whole variety of offspring. You know, long hair, short hair, long-legged, short-legged. That happens. But the first five are purely religious. That's not science. We never observe any of those. So if you want to win the debate on evolution, simply define exactly what you're talking about. And you'll find all they ever give are examples of number six, which there's no argument about it. It happens. But then they imply that that is somehow magically evidence for the other five, and it is not. The teachers are taught, though, be sure to stress to the students that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class, we should be teaching science. Things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, then how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all, we just think we're here. Okay, you can forget about those folks, right? We're here. So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, God created it, or the world just made itself like the humanists believe. It just is self-existing and not created. Well, if the world just made itself, how could this happen? Boy, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally, one day, he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many of you have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on the airplane years ago, flying from Dallas to San Francisco, and I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks in Knoxville have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> so here I was on the airplane about that far away from this guy, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that, so I talk about it with him. And he said he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, oh, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you have never heard of the Big Bang? 
I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang, and I believe in the Big Bang, but my Big Bang is a lot different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. And so the professor took off on one of those answers that looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, <clears throat> Mr. Hovind, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago, that's a long time, all the matter in the universe. That's a lot of stuff. By the way, the word universe comes from two Latin words, uni, which means single, and verse, which means a spoken sentence. Did you know we live in a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. Now that'll preach, man. There's a sermon in there someplace right there, okay? And if your pastor can't find it, he ain't got no preaching him at all, okay? All the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. Say what? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Wow. That's one crowded dot. And heavy, too. <laughs> hey, and it ain't the first time it happened, boys and girls. This textbook says, Someday after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. Can you believe they cut down a tree to print that? Where's Al Gore when you need him? Hmm, that's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> and why did you guys send Al Gore to Washington? You had him here, you know. But no. This textbook author was brilliant. I could not believe how smart this guy was. He said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. You have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? Yes, boys and girls, you see, one day nothing exploded. And here we are. We could spend three days talking about the Big Bang Theory. They used to say the thing that exploded was a few light years in diameter. Then they said, oh, no, it's only 275 million miles. And they said, oh, no, it's only 71 million miles. They keep getting it smaller, and now they're saying nothing exploded. Wow, Discover Magazine here a couple years ago said, where did everything come from? Boys and girls, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory will explain everything. Wow, I've got to meet this Alan Guth guy. Alan Guth said in Scientific American, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. In the Hebrew, that's a dot. He said it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. You see, boys and girls, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. <laughs> and they call that science? and put it in a science journal? I think I'd call that a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. I said, Professor, uh, what happened to your dot? He said, well, over 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the solar system was drawn into this little bitty tiny dot, and it was spinning. It spun faster and faster, and all of a sudden, shh, boom, it exploded, big bang. And the pieces that flew off became galaxies and sun, moon, stars, and here we are, you know, people, nothing but stardust. I said, sir, can I ask you a couple questions, please? He said, sure. What do you want to know? You know, we got a three-hour flight sitting that far away from each other on the airplane. And I said, well, sir, I got a question. Uh, you said 20 billion years ago all the dirt got together for the big squish and the big spin and the big bang. Where did all the dirt come from? You know, who made matter? He said, we don't know that for sure. I said, okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I have no idea. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically I believe in the beginning God and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me my theory is religious and your theory is scientific. <laughs> no, 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 they're both religious. The news media tries to make it look like it is science versus religion. No, it's not. It's not science versus religion. This is two religions. Evolution and creation are both religious. You have to believe in one or the other. 
The difference is the evolution religion is tax supported. That's the difference. One of many differences. By the way, these two timelines, it's the same thing right here behind me. On the top timeline, every inch represents 150 years. Abe Lincoln was not even president one inch ago. Okay? If I was to show you what 20 billion years looks like at the same scale as the top chart, I'd have to have a, this chart on the bottom to be this scale. This one would have to be 2,100 miles long. That's from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale for the other one. Okay. The professor said he did, he did not know where the matter came from. I said, well, sir, could you tell me where the laws came from? This universe is run by laws. You know, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, Boyle's law, Cole's law. You can eat that with potato salad. Okay. There's all kinds of laws in the universe. Where did the laws come from? And by the way, why aren't the laws still evolving? Do hmm? you ever think about that? I mean, why is gravity always the same? Why don't you weigh 10 pounds more one day? You say, well, I do. Well, that's for different reasons, okay? But uh, where did the energy come from anyway, huh? Who bought the gas to run this machine? He said, the professor said, I don't know any, we don't know any of those things. I said, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure, what else would you like to know? Else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, sir, does Berkeley uh, have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to your puke. You've been on them before? He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you really ought to get one. You know, you could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on there, any fourth graders in here last year or next year, fourth graders? I know it's summertime here. All right, I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. That's before they diagnosed ADD. <clears throat> By the time my brother was in fourth grade, we all knew what he was going to be when he got out of high school. 32. <laughs> well, we're going to put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round and get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. I'll tell you later. We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go faster, faster. Can't you go any faster? You get up around 30 miles an hour, the kids enter phase two where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. You get up around 30 miles an hour, the kids enter phase uh, 60 miles an hour. They enter phase three where they start screaming again, but now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop though, keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, you should enter phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. Now, when this happens, you will notice a very interesting phenomena of physics. If the merry-go-round is going clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or a pole. That's because of a law in physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. See, if a spinning object breaks apart, the pieces that fly off are going to spin the same direction because the outside's moving faster than the inside. And we could talk all day about the conservation laws if you'd like, but the professor said, yes, I know about the conservation laws. I said, well, good, sir, then let me ask you a question. If the universe began as a spinning dot, like you said, why do two planets spin backwards, and probably three? He got real quiet, puzzled look on his face. I said, sir, why do eight out of 91 known moons spin backwards? Why do Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons going both directions at the same time? Huh. Why is the sun 98% hydrogen and helium, but the other planets are less than 1% hydrogen and helium? And why are these nine planets so different from each other? If it all came from a big bang, I mean, what's, why are they all so different? Very different compositions. And why do some whole galaxies spin backwards? CNN did an article, Goofy Galaxy Spins in Wrong Direction. I said, sir, why are these things going backwards? He said, I don't know. Why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, sir, it's real simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God did it that way on purpose just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. <laughs> yes, amen. Now, I do believe in the Big Bang because the Bible teaches the Big Bang. It says, the heavens shall pass away the great noise. In the original Greek, that's a Big Bang. 
So there's going to be a big bang. It just didn't happen yet, okay? So kids, if you go to school and some professor says, hey, do you believe in the big bang? You should say, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. The big bang is coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> By the way, if the world came from a big bang and slowly evolved over billions of years, why did Jesus die on the cross? What's the purpose of the death of Christ? And when the Bible says God's going to restore the world like it used to be, restore it to what? More death and suffering? <laughs> we cover more on that theistic evolution position in video 7. And the Big Bang Theory is ludicrous for numerous reasons, okay? If the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed, but it's not. There's serious, serious problems with the Big Bang Theory. Even Fred Hoyle said, I have little hesitation in saying the sickly Paul hangs over the Big Bang Theory. Get more on that in the book called The Evolution Cruncher. It's a 900-page book. It's only five bucks. Excellent book to give away to every kid in your high school. The second law of thermodynamics tells us everything tends toward disorder. If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, fall apart, or break down. Nothing gets better by itself. That's what the Bible teaches. The heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. Nothing gets better by itself. Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Everything tends toward chaos, right? Here is Sue at 20. Here she is at 90. <laughs> and here she is at 3,000. Everything tends toward chaos, folks, all right? All you have to do is nothing, and everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out. That's what the second law is all about. Everything is getting worse. Nothing's getting better. But the textbook says, humans probably evolved from bacteria more than four billion years ago. Was your great, 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 grandpa bacteria? Evolutionists will say, well, Hovind, don't you know if you add energy, you can overcome the second law of thermodynamics. And the earth receives energy from the sun, so the earth is an open system, and that's how we overcome the law. I understand the argument, but they're missing the point. The universe is a closed system, number one. Number two, adding energy is destructive unless there's a special mechanism to use and harness the energy. See, the Japanese added a bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor one day. They didn't organize a thing for us, did they? So a few years later, we added some energy to a few of their cities, didn't we? You know, returned the favor. Didn't organize anything for them. Adding energy is destructive. The sun adds energy to the roof of your house, but it's going to destroy your house. The sun's energy will destroy the entire house. The sun's energy will destroy the roof on your car. It will destroy your upholstery. The sun's energy will destroy your paint job. There's only one thing that can actually use the sun's energy. Chlorophyll. And one little plant cell is more complex than a space shuttle. Cover more on that on video four. Now, evolution violates the second law, and evolution is wrong. Okay? This textbook shows the kids a fossil starfish. And it says, 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Was your great, 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 great grandpa a starfish? How about Discover Magazine, November 2004? Was your ancestor a sea sponge? This is your ancestor. Wow, who's your daddy? <laughs> Now, please don't laugh at this next picture, okay? This is going to be a picture of my brother <clears throat> when he first wakes up in the morning after his first cup of coffee, which apparently was a little too strong, okay? By the way, I've got to warn these kids. Kids, listen carefully. Do not drink coffee. Because if you drink coffee when you're young, when you get married, your babies will be born naked and illiterate. And tea is worse. There was an Indian once that drank four gallons of iced tea. That night, he drowned in his teepee. <laughs> be careful with that stuff. That's deadly. Anyway, this will be my brother. Now, please don't laugh. He can't help it. There he is right there. <laughs> Notice what the textbook says. 30 million years ago. Now, kids, let me translate that for you. Anytime a textbook says millions of years ago, what it means is long ago and far away. That means a fairy tale is coming next, okay? That's your warning, fairy tale coming up. 30 million years ago, these critters evolved. Ooh, there's that word again. You've got to watch that one. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans? 
Grandpa? <laughs> what big eyes you have, Grandpa. <laughs> well, the better to see you with, my boy. You know, we've been teaching kids they're nothing but an animal, and today a lot of them act like animals. Even Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She said, your kids go ape in school? Here's why. He's being taught evolution. Guess what, Johnny? You're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Uh, you mean I'm just an animal? Uh, okay. <laughs> Have you ever stopped and thought that possibly what we're teaching the kids is maybe affecting how they behave? Hmm? What you believe determines how you behave. Kids are taught today, you know, that you're just an animal. The rock music these days is all full of death and destruction and blood. Well, the Bible says, they that hate me love death. Kids are taught today there are no absolutes. I was in a debate one time, and this professor said, Hoven, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> Blew his little brain. Now, hold on a minute. How can I be absolutely sure? There's no absolute. I was speaking in a public school in Pennsylvania a couple years ago, and this kid sat on the second row, and he said, Hoven, I'm an atheist. There's no God. I said, are you sure? He said, I'm sure. I said, well, let me ask you a question, son. I said, do you know everything? He said, oh, no, no. I said, okay, well, good. I said, do you think maybe you know half of everything? He said, no. I said, okay, well, let's just pretend for a few minutes that you know half of everything. Would it be possible then for God to exist in the other half you don't know? Brand new thought rattled around in his brain for a while. Got lost, I'm sure. I said, by the way, son, if you're an atheist, let me ask you a simple question. How do you tell right from wrong? Ask an atheist that question sometime. How do you tell right from wrong? He said, that's easy. I decide what's right and wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I am going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, I can. You see, I am the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Do you see where that logic would lead in a hurry? If every man did that which was right in his own eyes, like the book of Judges said, serious problems for society, big time. How do you tell right from wrong? Simple question to ask an evolutionist. They don't have a way to tell. I mean, maybe, maybe Osama bin Laden should decide right from wrong. Huh? Maybe Bill Clinton should decide right from wrong, if he has any idea where to find it. I mean, how do you tell right from wrong? Simple. It's real easy to tell right from wrong. Thus saith the Lord. Now see, that is absolute. And the Lord said, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. Some people either don't know what God says, or maybe they just don't care what God says. But God says, don't do that, okay? <laughs> now if you did it in the past, okay, say, God, I'm sorry, that was dumb, and don't do it again, all right? A lot of teachers don't seem to understand. They just blindly follow the textbook and think they have to teach this evolution theory. No, you don't have to teach this evolution theory, okay? Teachers can teach creation in public schools if they want. We've got a videotape called the Public School Presentation, which deals with all the laws on that about teaching public schools, what, teaching creation in public schools. What happened was Arkansas and Louisiana passed laws to require that creation be taught. The court struck it down in both cases. They said, you cannot require that creation be taught. They said, the teachers can teach it if they want, but it has to be voluntary on the teacher's part. Even Stephen Gould said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before, and it can be taught now. He was commenting on the 1987 Supreme Court decision. What's happened, though, the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, they have tried really hard to spread the propaganda around that you cannot talk about creation in the public schools, and that's just simply not true. It's always been perfectly fine to teach creation in the public schools. There's never been a law against that at all, okay? But if a teacher gets up in front of their class and the teacher says, okay, kid, listen, listen, you started off like a slime and you slowly evolved to a human. You don't need to be a genius to figure out that teaching is going to destroy some kid's faith in the Bible. And anybody that destroys a child's faith Better read what Jesus said about that. He said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Anybody that teaches evolution is in trouble when they stand before God. 
The Bible says, Be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. It's interesting, though, what happened. Back in the 1950s, the average textbook in America had very little evolution. Two or three thousand words was all. 1957, the Russians beat us in the space race by launching Sputnik, and Americans panicked. How many of you are old enough to remember the panic in America when the Russians were winning the space race? I mean, they had articles in Life magazine, How You Can Survive Fallout. They said the Soviets are ahead of us in science because the Soviets teach evolution. We don't teach it in our schools. I mean, they had articles on how to build your own bomb shelter. People were building them in their backyard, okay, to survive nuclear fallout. Wait a minute. The Soviets are ahead in science because they teach evolution. What does evolution have to do with putting up a satellite? Well, then, in 1959, it was the 100-year anniversary of Darwin's book coming out. And in 1959, Eisenhower asked Congress for a billion dollars to push more evolution into the school system. And he got it. American textbooks were rewritten in the late 50s and early 60s to include more evolution. They called it the Cold War Reconstruction of American Science Education. Our whole science curriculum and other curriculums were rewritten to make sure evolution was taught. And by 1963, the average textbook had 33,000 words about evolution. By 1963, prayer was taken out of our school system. Anybody remember that? Madeline Murray O'Hare? By 1963, we started to see a great rise in premarital sex for every single age bracket. We saw a great rise in uh, sexually transmitted diseases for 10 to 14 year olds. We saw a great rise in unwed birth rates a 550% increase in pregnancies. The difference is being aborted. Now, one-third of all the kids born at the hospital are born to a couple that are not married, illegitimate children. A third of them. Now, listen carefully. If you are one of those, this is for you. Timothy was a half-breed that never should have been born. Timothy's mommy was Jewish. His daddy was Greek. The Jews weren't supposed to marry anybody but Jews. Mama disobeyed. Timothy's the result but he wanted to serve God. And God said, I'll take you, son. He wrote two books in your Bible. So if your parents messed up, you shut your mouth and quit your whining and you go serve God with your life, okay? There's no excuses. God will use anybody, okay? The number of unmarried couples living together has increased radically since 1963. God's word hasn't changed. He said, thou shalt not commit adultery. He said, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Jesus said, if you even look and lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. By the way, ladies, that's why it's important how you dress, okay? My daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. Okay. Divorce rates have gone crazy in this country. Child abuse is up 2,300%. Illegal drug use up 6,000%. Violent crimes nearly a 1,000% increase. I'm not that old, you know, but I remember the days when you did not have to lock your house. Anybody remember those days? And you left the keys in the ignition all the time. You never took them out because you might lose them. And you go to the average high school, and half the pickup trucks in the parking lot had a loaded rifle hanging in the back window. And nobody got shot in school in those days, did they? You probably didn't hear about this, but the kids at Columbine High School that shot everybody, you know, were very strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. Hitler hated black people, so so did they. This was evolution-motivated shooting. And right after the shooting, Rosie O'Donnell caught on her TV program and said, See, we need more gun control. Uh, Rosie, those kids broke 18 gun laws going into that school. I don't think two more gun laws would have slowed them down. See, Rosie can't figure it out. But one guy figured out the whole thing and put it on the spare tire cover on his van. I saw that, I said, man, I have got to get a picture of this. This explains everything. He said, blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. <laughs> it's not the spoon's fault, Rosie, okay? <laughs> and it's not the gun's fault either. Yeah, blame the gun, that's brilliant. SAT scores have plummeted since 1963. Twice in the last 40 years, they have dumbed down the test. They made the test dumber. So the scores would go back up. Teen suicide rate's gone crazy. Now look, 
If I told you, if you kissed a frog, it would turn to a prince. You say, no, frogs don't turn to princes. How many of you ladies got your husband by kissing a frog? Come on, let's see. Looks like only about three, okay? See, it doesn't happen very often, but in the textbooks it does. We started off like an amoeba and slowly evolved to a frog and very slowly became a prince. <laughs> it's the same fairy tale. See, if the frog turns to the prince quickly, we all know it's a fairy tale. But if the frog turns to the prince slowly, oh, no, that's modern science. No, I'm sorry, that's still a fairy tale, okay? Even more of a fairy tale. The difference, though, is not a kiss. That won't do it anymore. Today, boys and girls, if you want to turn your frog to a prince, you have to have a super-duper special high-powered magic ingredient called billions and billions of years. How many have ever heard that before? Billions of years ago. It's in all the textbooks. It's on TV. It's in the magazines. It's in National Pornographic. A geographic, I mean. Billions and billions of years ago. They talk about a, some, like a, some kind of fact of science, you know. Here's a fourth grade textbook. It says, many millions of years ago. Now, wait a minute. If anybody ever says that to me, I say, uh, excuse me, were you there? I'll say, no, of course I wasn't there. And I'll say, now, do you know the earth is millions of years old? I mean, is this really part of science? Is this something we can observe and study and test and demonstrate? They'll say, well, no, but everybody believes the earth is millions of years old. No, they don't. Most Americans believe the earth is less than 10,000 years old and God made it. Less than 15% are ever evolutionists or atheists in the test that they take, in the surveys. The majority of Americans do not believe the earth is millions of years old. Now, it's true that slightly more than half of the scientists believe in evolution. That's true. I agree. But that doesn't make it true. It's true they believe it, but what they believe is not true. See, just because a bunch of scientists believe something, that doesn't mean anything. There was a time when the scientists thought the planets go around the earth. The scientists used to teach a big rock will fall faster than a little rock. They used to teach if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood and you will get better. There were special places all over America to get your blood taken out. You could tell where they were because they had a white pole with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. And right beside George Washington, when they were bleeding him to death, was a Bible that told him the life of the flesh is in the blood. Man, if they'd have read that verse, he might still be alive today. Well, he would have lived longer, okay? But listen, if you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did the boat sink? You say, I don't know. <laughs> well, look at the dates on the coins. If there's a coin in that box from 1750, you ought to be able to figure out the boat sank after 1750. How many can figure this out with no help at all? Okay, It couldn't sink before that, could it? You don't poke around in the box and find the oldest coin. You have to find the most recent coin, and that kind of limits when the boat could have sunk. That's called the limiting factor. Did you know there are probably a hundred different ways to tell how old the Earth is? A lot of them give big numbers, a lot of them give small numbers, but it's the small ones we've got to worry about. If you find a dinosaur bone, you should notice two things about it immediately. Number one, it does not talk. Number two, it does not have a date stamped on it. It does not say, made by a dinosaur in 70 million B.C. in Taiwan. <laughs> they don't say that, okay? So how do you tell the age of a fossil? How do you tell the age of the Earth? How old is this Earth anyway? Well, the Bible dates add up to about 6,000. Textbook says it's billions. Somebody is wrong. There's a difference between 6,000 and 20 billion. Congress doesn't seem to understand the difference, but there's a difference, okay? And we'll talk about that in the next session. How do you show the earth is not billions of years old? But if it is only 6,000 years old like the Bible teaches, that raises some interesting questions. What about the dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? How did the light from the stars get here? What about Grand Canyon? Didn't that take millions of years to form? What about the geologic column? Well, folks, that's why my seminar is about 17 hours long. I am talking as fast as I can go. But we cover all that. We'll cover some more of that in just a minute. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When was the beginning? The Bible says that Jesus created all things in heaven and earth. 
Well, wait, wait, wait. Did God create the heaven and the earth, or did Jesus create the heaven and the earth? Well, they're both fine. Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, in spite of what Jehovah's false witnesses teach, okay? Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? By the way, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? But Jesus said that was the beginning. Same thing in Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. The Bible says death came into the world because of man's sin. Nothing died until Adam sinned. By man came death. The Bible's real clear on the topic. And Adam was the first man. And Eve was the mother of all living. Well, that makes it pretty easy then. We just add up the dates. The Bible says Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Seth was 105 when Enos was born. Enos was 90 when Canaan was born. You go through the Bible, you add up the dates. It's not hard to do. You can make a chart like this pretty easily. If you get my seminar notebook, the last page folds out to be that chart. Or we've got them laminated like this one. If you want them for placemats when your skeptic friends come for lunch, you can really stir up a conversation with one of those things. But <laughs> we've got quite a few placemats our ministry offers, so different things to make kids read that instead of the cereal box. But uh, if you add up the dates in the Bible, you're going to get about 4,000 B.C. for the creation. Not millions of years ago, about 4,000. Now, I'm not one of those guys that tries to put an exact date on it. I don't say it was 4,004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon. I don't think you can get that close from Scripture. I think Adam was made in the afternoon, because it was just before Eve. It's the only clue I found. And I can't prove this, but I think I figured out why God made Adam first. I think God made Adam first because he didn't want any advice on how to do it. <laughs> how many would agree with that one? <laughs> By the way, B.C. means before Christ. Almost all the new textbooks are changing it to say B.C.E., before the common era. Christ is gone from the schools, folks. Textbook says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Well, was he lying? Did he not understand science? Or was he right? How old is the earth? When was the beginning? Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth. How old is this earth? Could that date of 4000 BC be correct? I do many debates at universities and speak on a lot of talk shows and stuff, and there's always some atheist will call in and say, Hoven, uh, I've got a question. Who did Adam's sons marry? Hmm. Uh, good question, and a fair question. I say that's a good question, and I'll be glad to answer that. However, you guys are the ones that have a serious problem. The Bible says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived. Well, it doesn't say he found her there, but who was his wife, and who did Seth marry anyway? And I think I can answer that. However, compared to the evolutionists, we have a minor problem. See, they believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang where nothing exploded and made everything. And 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, and it was a hot ball of rock. Earth began as a hot ball of rock. And then millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> it sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. This guy said, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to the Big Bang Theory, 20 billion years ago there was a Big Bang, and then 4.6 billion years ago the Earth cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years. It turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry... Now, there's a good trick. And something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. That's the Big Bang Theory. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. I spoke at a college in Boston one time. They said, Hovind, you can come speak at our college if our professors can ask you any questions they want. Because we like to show to students how dumb you Christians really are. I said, I would be honored to come for that. So I showed up, there were six professors and all their students in the room, you know, I felt like Daniel in the lion's den. I said, folks, I got my charts out, I said, folks, I believe the Bible. I believe 6,000 years ago God made everything, and 4,400 years ago there was a flood that destroyed everything. Noah saved two of each kind, not species, kind, on the ark. 
And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe, you know. 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, uh, Earth cooled down, rained on the rocks for millions of years, and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. One professor was really upset. He said, Hovind, do you realize there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world? I said, oh, yeah, there's a bunch. He said, do you mean to tell me that you believe all those dogs came from just two dogs on Noah's Ark? Do you expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all those dogs came from a rock. He didn't have any more questions after that. But anyway, who did Adam's sons marry? Well, the Bible says Adam lived after he begat Seth 800 years and begat sons and daughters. How many kids could you have in 800 years? Several, right? A friend of mine in Arkansas has 15 kids in 15 years. I met a family from Minnesota with 20 children, all of them under 20. It's cold in Minnesota. (laughs) So who did Adam's sons marry? Well, duh, they married sisters. You say, married sisters? Well, calm down. First place, there's no other choice, okay? Secondly, who are you going to report them to? (laughs) Think about it. Thirdly, there were no laws against it until 2,500 years later when Moses gave the law. They didn't need laws against it at first. For the first 1,000 years or so, the race had genetically no defects, no problem marrying sisters. See, everything about you is inherited. Even having children is hereditary. If your parents don't have any, you won't either. You say, wow, I never thought about that. Go think about it. You'll see I'm right. People say, you can't marry sisters. What about genetic similarity? Adam married his rib. Talk about genetic similarity. (laughs) It's not going to be a problem, okay? And you won't notice this reading the Bible, but when you graph out the dates, it's pretty amazing. You'll realize that Adam lived long enough to know his great, 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 great grandson. Noah's daddy could have known Adam for 56 years. Can you imagine a family reunion back in those days? All right, everybody hop on the camel. We're going to go visit great, 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 grandpa Adam. And he's going to tell us what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the first woman ate the first man out of house and home. I do tell a lot of Adam and Eve jokes. I'll just tell you right now. And this one lady said, well, just where would you men be without us women? I said, in the Garden of Eden. (laughs) But it'd be lonely. It wouldn't be worth it, okay? No. You won't notice this reading your Bible either, but when you graph out the dates, it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Noah's son Shem lived long enough after the flood to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 13 kids, 12 boys, one girl. One of those boys was Joseph. He's the guy that got the coat of many colors, and the brothers got jealous and beat him up and threw him in the pit, and he ended up down in Egypt, and he became the vice pharaoh, or whatever they call him. And he invited the brothers to move down and live with them. So Joseph is introducing his dad, Jacob, to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said, I'm 130. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. I read that verse 36 years ago as a brand new Christian. And I thought, what's he saying here? I'm 130, but this is nothing compared to my ancestors. Yeah, when you figure he could have personally known Shem, Arfax, and Selah, and Eber. You know, if you're 130, but you know a 600-year-old that lives around the corner, you just don't feel so old anymore. Anyway, textbook says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Now, was he lying? Was he stupid? Or was he right? How old is the earth? Do the books in this town teach the kids the earth is billions of years old? Are they going to learn this in school when they go back? Of course they are. 4.6 billion years ago. Even some Christians are teaching the earth is billions of years old. Some people who really sincerely, honestly love the Lord. This list of folks tells some of those, just a few of those that are teaching the earth is billions of years old. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours on the John Ankerberg show. Both of those guys believe the earth is billions of years old. People say, who who cares? What difference does it make? It makes a giant difference. Because if you're going to have billions of years, you're going to have death before sin. Now you have a heresy. And it's heresy. It's not heresy to believe the earth is billions of years old, but it's heresy to put death before sin. That's a clear heresy. Okay? The Bible says death reigned from Adam to Moses. By man came death. In Adam all die. 
Who cares about the age of the earth? Well, for one thing, the credibility of Genesis is at stake. Because the average person reading that book is not going to find billions of years in there. So the question is real simple. Can the average person read the Bible and understand it, or do we have to have some guru tell us what it means? Secondly, the credibility of Jesus is at stake, since he quoted Genesis 25 times. And just about every other book in the Bible refers to the book of Genesis. It's an important topic. And the evolutionists really care. If you take away billions of years, their theory looks real silly. Jesus said, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. He wrote of me. Well, the Bible clearly teaches about 6,000 years. Let's see what the scientific evidence says. In 1999, the world's population crossed over the 6 billion mark. In 1985, there were 5 billion people on planet Earth. In 1800, there was 1 billion people here. Everybody agrees there were about a billion people around 1800. And everybody agrees the population is growing rapidly. But the world is not overcrowded. Don't fall for that overcrowded propaganda going around the schools. The world is not overcrowded. The whole world's population today, all 6 billion people, would fit inside Jacksonville, Florida. Twice. That little city has 25 billion square feet. The world's not overcrowded, folks. Have you driven across Nebraska? <laughs> or Kansas? Or New Mexico? Or Texas? Drive across Texas. Anybody ever driven across Texas? You can go for three days. Are we still in Texas? Yeah, nothing out there but flat rabbits. I tell you what. No. The world's not overcrowded. Drive across Tennessee, for heaven's sake. It's not overcrowded. Look, if it's overcrowded where you are, move. Because <laughs> there's plenty of room out there, other places, okay? Back when Jesus was here, the world's population was only about a quarter of a billion. It looks like the whole population growth curve started about 4,400 years ago. Hmm. Now, if you believe in evolution, you've got a problem. You think man's been here for three million years. In three million years, the population would have grown. Right now, there'd be about 150,000 people per square inch. That would be crowded. No, man's not been here for millions of years. God told Adam to replenish the earth, fill it with kids, have lots of kids, okay? He formed the world to be inhabited, Isaiah 45 tells us, okay? But we've got people on the other side who think we should reduce the population of the earth. That's Satan's plan, of course. Jacques Cousteau said, we need to eliminate 350,000 people a day. Ted Turner said, we need a 95% decline in populations. Okay, Ted, you first. <laughs> These guys for the New World Order want to reduce the population of the world to a half billion. See, Satan was told by the Lord er, in the Garden of Eden, you're going to crawl on your belly and eat dust all your life. Then the Lord said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Satan knows someday some seed of the woman is going to bruise his head, and he's not looking forward to that. So he's decided he's going to kill every human being on the planet. Satan's goal is to kill all of humanity, to thwart God's plan. God said, fill the earth with kids, have a bunch of kids. Satan says, no, we're going to reduce it to zero. Remember when Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus in Bethlehem? What did he do? Kill all the children. Let's be sure to get the right one. Let's just kill them all. And Satan's going to try to kill every human being on the planet. Charles Wooster said, people are the cause of all the problems. We need to get rid of some of them. Bill Clinton signed the Biodiversity Treaty that said we need to reduce the Earth's population to one billion. They've already got the Earth divided up into regions. The red areas are for animals only. No human beings allowed. Treaty's been signed. It just hasn't been enforced yet. Coming soon, though. P Peter Singer is the guy who wants to have abortions after the baby's born. You've got 28 days to decide if you want to keep it. He said, Christianity is our foe. If animal rights is to succeed, we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition, like animals have more rights than humans. Greg said, the world has cancer. The cancer is man. Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth, she's the one that invented the microwave. Never mind. Prince Philip said, if I could be reincarnated, I would wish to return to Earth as a killer virus to lower human population levels. Nice guy, Phil. By the way, Monsanto's real busy on working on genetically modified foods. They banned them in Europe, but 70% of everything you eat now is, contains genetically modified foods, causing all kinds of problems with health. 
Get the book Seeds of Deception, if you want a whole lot more on that. Or Engineered Extinction from the New American Magazine about how our, seed, our, our food is being tampered with to reduce the population. The United Nations said food is power. We use it to control behavior. We do not apologize. And before you get excited about vaccines, you might want to read uh, what's happening with the viruses being injected in with the vaccines, the time bombs being planted in there. Long story on that. We cover more on that on our Bible and Health videotape. Um, autism has gone crazy. There's been a 75,000% increase in autism in Illinois. It's from vaccines, most people believe. Sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, seems to be from vaccines. In Australia, they made vaccines non-mandatory. 50% of the people dropped out and had a 50% drop in uh, SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Go to uh, maritoco.com if you want more on vaccines. But people, I, there are people who want to reduce the population of the earth. Go outside of Atlanta, Georgia, to the town of Elberton. Go north about seven or eight miles on Highway 77. And look off to the right. You'll see a place over there where they teach you should reduce the population of the planet. If you look off to the right, you'll see these stones over here. It looks like Stonehenge. You drive over there, it's the weirdest place, middle of nowhere. You get up and you read them, and it says in 12 languages, the Ten Commandments for the New World Order. Commandment number one, maintain humanity under one-half billion. Well, now, hold on a minute. There's already six billion people here. How do they propose to maintain humanity under a half billion? Looks to me like there's going to have to be a dramatic drop in population. That's exactly what the devil wants. More on that in our college class, CSE 101. Well, regardless of what happens in the future, the population today tells us man's only been here about 4,400 years. They say it looks like there's been a genetic bottleneck. The whole population was reduced to a few thousand just a couple thousand years ago. Hey, they're getting closer. Actually, it was all reduced to eight about 4,400 years ago. Keep studying. I tell everybody, you keep studying. When you get done climbing the mountain of truth, you find the Baptists have been sitting there all along. Yeah. Galaxies are spinning, but the stars in the middle go faster than the stars at the outside. So why do we still have spiral arms on the galaxies? They should not be there, okay? Galaxies are evidence that the Earth, the universe at least, is not billions of years old. Stars are blowing up all the time. It's called a supernova or a nova. But a star blows up about every 30 years, and yet there's less than 300 supernova uh, fragments that have been found, remnants. That's only a few thousand years' worth of stars. Why aren't there billions of supernova remnants? Some people say, well, new stars are forming in Crab Nebula or Eagle Horsehead Nebula. No, that's a bunch of baloney. We covered that on Video 7. Nobody's ever seen a star form. The planet Jupiter is cooling off rapidly. Saturn, the stars are, are changing from red giants to white dwarfs. The textbook says it takes billions of years. We know that's not true. All the ancient astronomers said Sirius was a red star. Today it's a white dwarf. It happens in a few thousand years. Don't let them tell you it takes billions of years. Jupiter is cooling off rapidly, constantly losing heat. It cannot be billions of years old. It would have been cold by now. Jupiter's moon Ganymede has a strong magnetic field, indicating a liquid core, meaning it is not billions of years old. Saturn's rings are expanding away from the planet. They cannot be billions of years old. There's more about that in the book In the Beginning by Walt Brown. Excellent book, by the way. The moon goes around the Earth. How many knew that already? The moon goes around the Earth. But you know, as the moon goes around the Earth, it's gradually getting farther away. We're slowly losing the moon. It's leaving us a couple inches a year. No big deal. Nothing to worry about. Plus, nothing you can do about it anyway. But the moon is getting farther from the Earth every day. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The moon is getting farther from the earth every day. So that means that it used to be closer. How many can figure this out with no help at all? Okay. Well, if you bring the moon in closer, you start to create a problem because the moon causes the tides. Now, you folks in Knoxville probably don't worry about the tides, but in Pensacola, you worry about the tides. See, if the moon was closer, the tides would be higher. There's a law called the inverse square law. If you brought the moon into one-third the distance, you take the one-third, flip it over, and square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. If you run all the math on this, you'll find out the moon and Earth would have been almost together 1.4 billion years ago. Walt Brown says 1.2 billion years ago is the max lifespan for Earth and moon. Well, 
if the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the earth, that explains what happened to the tall dinosaurs. They got mooned. Uh, comets are flying around through space, but comets are constantly losing material. I mean, stuff blows off the tail of a comet. You can't just keep losing, okay? Pretty soon it's gone. You know, it's kind of like your checkbook. See, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every single time. Well, these comets are always losing material. That's something you just can't keep doing forever. Most astronomers say comets can't last more than about 10,000 years. Okay, well then, I have a question. Why do we still have comets out there? They should all be gone by now. I mentioned in a seminar years ago that comets is an indication that the solar system is less than 10,000 years old, and an atheist went home and devoted an entire website against me, anti-Hovind website. There are now over 1,000. One guy told me there's closer to 2,000 anti-Hovind websites. I'm so proud of myself. Well, this one scoffer on his website said, Hoven, don't you know that a Dutch astronomer back in 1950, his, his name was Jan Oort, he proposed, it means he hoped, he wished, he prayed, that there was a great shell of comets out there and new ones keep coming in to replace the old ones that are burning out. So his, his, he said, the reason we still have comets is because new ones are replacing the ones that are burning up. They called it the Oort cloud of comets. He said this Oort cloud is 50,000 astronomical units away. Well, if you don't know what an astronomical unit is, it's the distance from the sun to the earth. That's one astronomical unit. It's pretty hard to see Pluto without a really good telescope. And Pluto is only 39 astronomical units away. You're never going to see a comet at 50,000 astronomical units, that's for sure, okay? Nobody's ever seen this Oort cloud. Oort never saw the Oort cloud. The whole thing's based on a mathematical mistake. There is no Oort cloud. Even Carl Pagan, a Sagan, said, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there's not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. There is no Oort cloud. But this scoffer on his website said, Hoven, if you want to use the comet argument, you know, to prove the Earth is young, it's up to you to prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. Wait, 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 wait. How would you prove the non-existence of something? Wouldn't I have to be all places at the same instant to prove something doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. What he's trying to do here is called shifting the burden of proof. The liberals do it to us all the time and we fall for it. I'll show you how easy it is to do. Okay? Suppose I said, watermelons are blue on the inside until you cut the skin. Prove I'm wrong. Mm, that's called shifting the burden of proof. That'd be pretty hard to do, wouldn't it? As soon as you cut the skin, oh, see, it turned red. I was right. It was blue a second ago. <laughs> he says, I have to prove there's no Oort cloud. Now, wait, 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 Dave. Here's what we know. We know we have comets. We know they don't last more than about 10,000 years. We know the Bible says the Earth is 6,000 years old. I don't have a problem with comets. But he wants to make it look like I have a problem with comets when he's the one who's got the problem. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. It's interesting. Evolution theory has the sun and stars evolving before the earth. The Bible says God made the earth before the sun and stars. Everything about the evolution theory is backwards to the Bible. Every single thing, absolutely backwards. These theories don't match. Everything's backwards. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible says God created man, and evolution says, no, man created God. These theories are polar opposite. People say, couldn't God use evolution to create? Well, he could have, but it's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. The God that would use evolution is cruel, wasteful, and retarded. It's not a God you'd want to pray to, that's for sure. Cover more on that on video 7 of the Blue Series of Tapes back there. The psalmist said, when I consider thy heavens... By the way, heavens is plural. We get into that more on video two. He said, when I consider... Kids, you do yourself a favor once in a while to shut off that TV and go outside and consider the heavens. Go see what God has done. The psalmist said, while I was musing, the fire burned. The word muse means think. Think. The Bible uses the word twice. Think. 
Now, English is a pretty interesting language, you know. A theist is a person who says he believes in God. If you put the letter A in front of a word, it means the opposite. So an atheist is a person who says he does not believe in God. Muse means to think. You got it. Amuse means literally to not think. Did you know we've got entire parks where you can pay money and go do that? They're called amusement parks. Mm -hmm. The place to not think. He said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, it's interesting. A person that spends his time considering what God has done is just not impressed with what man can do. And some of you parents ought to go home and look in your kid's bedroom, and if what you see all over the wall are pictures of sports heroes, you listen carefully. You're training your kids to meditate on what man can do, not what God can do. And his brain, his thinking process is going to be about that deep. You know, the depth of his understanding is, wow, he threw the ball through the hoop. Oh, <laughs> who's going to care in a thousand years? Who's going to care in five years? Does anybody know who won the stupid bowl, Super Bowl five years ago? Does anybody care? Doesn't matter, does it? All those grown men out there fighting over that one ball, and they can all afford to go buy their own. <laughs> I mean, it's not sinful. It is just dumb to pay a guy $5 million to carry a pig bladder down a cow pasture through some plumbing. It's not going to last, folks. Think about things that are going to last forever, like what God has done, okay? Meditate on that. The Bible says, speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. The earth is like a big magnet. Now, magnets always lose their strength. The earth's magnet has lost 10% of its strength in the last uh, 150 years. That means, of course, it used to be stronger, since it's getting weaker, and it cannot be more than 25,000 years old. Just the Earth's magnetic field decline limits it to less than 25,000 years, and that also means carbon dating can't work. I'll give you a few examples here. The lower leg of a mammoth <clears throat> dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000. One part of a mammoth is 29,000 years old, another part's 44,000. You talk about a slow birth. Cover more on carbon dating on video number seven and all the serious problems with that. But the textbooks will say, well, yes, the magnetic field's getting weaker, but that's because it's reversing, okay? It's a pattern of reversals. No, there are no magnetic reversals in the magnetic field at the bottom of the ocean. We cover that on video six. This is all part of another theory called Pangea. How many have ever heard of Pangea before? That all the continents used to fit together. Well, I bet they didn't tell you they shrank Africa nearly 40% to make them fit, did they? Did they tell you they took out all of Mexico and Central America? Senor, que pasa? Donde esta Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? And they don't, they don't tell you what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. <clears throat> Did you know, if you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath. People say, Hoban, do you think the continents were ever connected? I say, well, what do you mean? They're still connected. I mean, like right now, you know, it's just the low places are full of water, that's all. What do you mean, were they connected? Hello, they're still connected. <laughs> what a dumb theory. We cover more on that on video number six about Pangea, uh, what's called the Hoven theory. But the Earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, but the Earth is slowing down. The Earth actually slows down about a thousandth of a second every day. The Earth slows down. Astronomy Magazine ran an article in 1992. They said, Earth's rotation is slowing down. June will be one second longer than normal. We will have a leap second. Leap second? Yep. They have to have a leap second about every year to year and a half because the Earth is slowing down. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The Earth is spinning, but it is slowing down. So that means that it used to be going faster. How many can figure this out with no help at all? Four, five, six, nine. Okay, good. Well, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, this is not a problem. I mean, it was going a little faster. Adam wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch anyway, as far as we know. But uh, some of these guys would like me to believe the Earth is billions of years old. 
Man, if you go back billions of years, you're going to have a problem. The earth would be spinning pretty quick. Get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. You'd never get nothing done. Centrifugal force would have been enormous. Man, the winds would have been 5,000 miles an hour from the Coriolis effect. And you want me to believe the dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? Well, I know what happened to them. <laughs> they got blown off. No, they did not live no millions of years ago. Uh, the Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. The wind almost always blows the same way. This creates a serious problem. The hot air comes off the desert, kills the trees next door, and that area becomes desert. The process is called desertification. You can read about it in an earth science book. Sahara Desert has been studied very carefully. They did a long study on this and said, you know what, folks, the Sahara Desert is probably about 4,000 years old. That's when it started growing. Egypt used to be fertile land all over the place. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger desert someplace? Why would the biggest desert on the planet be less than 4,000 years old? Well, <clears throat> I have a theory about that. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Now, it's pretty hard to have a desert under a flood. You got to admit, that would be tough, okay? So the desert couldn't start growing until the flood water went down. So I predict, based on the Bible, the biggest desert in the world will be less than 4,400 years old. It is. Wow. Maybe the Bible's right. You know, when they drill into the ground, sometimes they hit oil. The oil's under incredible pressure in some places, up to 20,000 pounds per square inch. It'll come squirting up out of the ground, like a big zip. 20,000 PSI. Well, the guys who study the rocks on top of the oil say, you know, it just can't handle that pressure for more than about 10,000 years. I know the weight of rock supplies pressure, but the, the pressure in the well is greater than the weight of overburden. They say it should have cracked the rock and leaked off in, in less than 10,000 years. Okay, well then I, now I've got two questions. Where did the oil come from? And why is it still under pressure? Hmm. Well, most scientists agree that oil comes from organisms that are squished. They're changed by heat and pressure into oil. They learned in 1971 how to make oil in 20 minutes in the laboratory. In Australia, they've got a treatment plant that takes sewage sludge and turns it into oil in 30 minutes. There's a factory in Turkey that just opened up, a factory in Texas that takes turkey guts and takes, pressurizes them and heats them and turns them into oil. They said in the article, we duplicated what Mother Nature does, but what Mother Nature took millions of years to do, we do in about 30 minutes. Sinclair has the dinosaur as their logo. They say dinosaurs turn to oil. Yes, boys and girls, they mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. I have a theory about the oil. Now, here's my theory, okay? I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood, okay? In that flood, lots of critters and people drowned. They got buried by the gravel and the rocks and the mud and the sand, and it got pretty heavy after a while, and it squished them <laughs> into oil. So the oil is down there today from the people and animals that drowned in that flood, which means if you stop and think about that, you drove over here tonight. <clears throat> on some of your ancestors. Well, Noah's uncles anyway. Next time you're at the gas station, pumping them in there, you can say, bye, Grandpa. You should have listened to Noah. <laughs> he told you it's going to rain. <clears throat> I was preaching in Denver one time, and some guys came and they said, Hovind, we know you teach the earth is only 6,000 years old. Uh, we'd like to prove to you you're wrong. Would you come with us, please? I said, sure. They took me to this big freezer in Denver, outside of Denver in Lakewood, it's the National Ice Core Laboratory. 36 below zero in there. They put this big suit on me, big hat, big gloves, big boots. I was freezing in five seconds when I walked in there. I got Florida blood, you know, it's real thin. They said, Hovind, we go to Greenland and we drill holes through the ice. You know, government job. And we take this big pipe, we drill it down in, and we bring this ice core out of the middle of the pipe and we save it in this big freezer here in Lakewood, Colorado. We have 10 ice cores stored in this freezer. They said, they, should, they took me over and showed me one of the ice cores. They said, you see these rings on here? It looks like tree rings, dark light, dark light. I said, oh yeah, it's real clear. They said, well, what happens in the summer, the snow melts a little bit, and then it refreezes and makes clear ice. It shows up dark on the picture. 
In the winter, the snow just packs. It doesn't get a chance to melt. And so it shows up as a white layer. So these layers represent summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. They said, now the deepest hole we've ever drilled is 10,000 feet deep. And we counted these ice rings, and there were 135,000 of them. And now you're going around telling everybody the Earth is 6,000 years old. We can prove it's at least 135,000. I said, fellas, aren't you assuming those are annual rings? See, they didn't know about the lost squadron, apparently. But in World War II, some airplanes ran out of gas and landed in Greenland. Has anybody ever heard of the Lost Squadron? Okay, it's been on TV a bunch of times. Well, the airplanes got left there in 1942. They went on and fought the war. Everybody forgot about them until a rich millionaire from Kentucky got a brilliant idea. Go find those airplanes and bring them home. He went there looking for the airplanes. They had to use ground-penetrating radar to penetrate the ice, and they located the planes. They melted a hole to get down to a P-38. It was 263 feet below the surface. They melted this hole down to get to the plane, took the plane apart, and brought the pieces back up through the hole and put it back together in Middleborough, Kentucky, not too far from here. How far is Middleborough from Knoxville? About two hours, maybe? Okay. The plane's up, that's where its home base is, Middleborough. Well, the planes were in the ice for 48 years. They were 263 feet down. That's uh, five and a half feet a year. Now, the deepest hole they've ever drilled is 10,000 feet. You divide that by five and a half, you get 1,800 years. I know deeper layers get squished, called glacial fern, so really 4,000 years is plenty of time to put all the ice at the North and South Pole. So why isn't there more ice at the North and South Pole? Hmm. I visited the museum and saw the guy who dug out the airplane. His name is Bob Carden. I said, Bob, <clears throat> when you went down to get to that airplane, did you, melt through, did you go through ice rings? He said, oh, yeah, many hundreds of them. I said, now, wait a minute. How can there be hundreds of ice rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be somewhere around 48? He said, who told you those are annual layers? He said, that doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week in Knoxville, can't you? Yeah. But here's a guy still calling them annual layers. Now, either he's ignorant or he's lying. I hope he's just ignorant, because ignorance can be fixed. You see, stupid is forever, but ignorance can be fixed. That's the difference, by the way. Uh, a guy that works with the Eskimo said, Brother Hovind, I got uh, 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 distinct layers of snow. Hmm. You kids are going to be taught that each of the layers of the earth is a different age. They've got Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archeozoic. Did you know the whole geologic column is baloney? It doesn't exist. We covered that on video four. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up connecting these rock layers. Petrified tree connecting a bunch of layers can't be millions of years difference in the, age, in the age of those layers. One in Cookville, Tennessee, not far from here. The bottom is coalified, the center is petrified, the top is coalified again. Runs through two coal seams. Cover more on that on video six about coal formation. Mount St. Helens blew trees into Spirit Lake. They're going to petrify very quickly, standing up. That's the way they sank to the bottom. They got waterlogged. Wood petrifies quickly. Here's petrified firewood. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. It does not take millions of years to give birth. Petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. The article's on the table down here called The Limestone Cowboy. The Mississippi River is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons every hour. 80,000 tons of mud comes down and dumps off around New Orleans, and that delta is growing larger and larger. They studied the delta pretty carefully and say it probably took about 30,000 years to put all that mud out there in the delta. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why isn't the whole Gulf of Mexico full of mud by now? They'll say, Hovind, it's 30,000 years. That proves the Bible's wrong. The Bible says 6,000. I know, but see, I've got a theory about that. Now, here's my theory. I believe 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that mud washed out there in 20 minutes. 
So it looks like it took 30,000 years to get the mud out there. It took about 20 minutes. And then 4,400 years since then, okay? A friend of mine from Louisiana is a pastor of a church. He said, Brother Hovind, I used to work in the oil field drilling in the, Missis in the, Gulf, of Mississippi, in the Gulf of Mexico, drilling for oil. He said, we drilled down through 14,000 feet of mud and hit trees 60 feet tall, standing up. 60 foot vertical trees under 14,000 feet of mud. Hmm. More about that on video six. Here's a picture of the oldest tree on the planet. It's called the bristlecone pine. We've got a piece of bristlecone in our museum in Pensacola. It's only 30 inches in diameter and it's 700 years old. You can count the rings with a magnifying glass. It grows real slow. Now, tree ring dating is not an exact science. Trees can produce two rings a year or three rings a year, okay? And be very careful about tree ring dating with overlapping sequencing. We we'll cover more on that during Q&A time if you'd like. But the oldest tree in the world, this textbook says, is 4,300 years old. Earth's oldest organism. That's a pretty old tree. But I've got a question. If the Earth is millions of years old, why don't we have an older tree someplace? Why would the oldest tree be 4,300 years old? I have a theory about that. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything, and 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. And so I predict the oldest tree ought to be somewhere around 4,300 years old. It is. Wow. Maybe that Bible's right, you know? Maybe you ought to read that thing and believe it. Here's a picture of a coral reef. You know, the largest reef in the world's in Australia. I had a call from a church in Brisbane one time. They said, do you want to come preach over here in Australia? I said, I need to pray about this. He said, yes. I took my whole family over to Australia. My daughter and I got to go scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef. It was incredible. Some of the reef was destroyed during World War II by ships and anchors and bombs and stuff like that. So the environmentalist wackos went out there to see how fast it grows back. They watched the reef grow for 20 years. It was a government project. <laughs> After watching it go for 20 years, they said the reef is less than 4,200 years old. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger reef someplace? Why on earth would the biggest reef be only 4,200 years old? I have a theory about that. I bet you know what it is, don't you? Can you figure it out by now? Okay. <laughs> Here's a picture of Niagara Falls. The textbook says, boys and girls, the rocky ledge above Niagara Falls has been eroding for nearly 9,900 years. Now, how do they know that? Well, the rocks are breaking off the edge. I mean, all waterfalls do that. They break rocks off, and the waterfall eats its way backwards, okay? Flows one direction, erodes the other direction. Niagara Falls is moving back 4.7 feet a year. Charles Lyell went there in 1841 and said, well, Niagara Falls is here. Obviously, it started up here at the cliff by Lewiston, New York, moving back down the gully. He said it's 10,000 years old worth of erosion. The people that lived there said, Charlie, it erodes a whole lot faster than you think. One good rainstorm and there's a whole lot of erosion takes place. He figured three feet a year, purposely to make the Bible look wrong. He hated the Bible. We get into more of him on video number four. Today, Niagara Falls is way back there, split over that island. There's actually two Niagara Falls, the Canadian side and the American side. It's eroded back quite a ways just since Charles Lyell's time. The textbook says this gorge that the river runs into, it runs in, is seven and a half miles long. A simple calculation shows it's been 9,900 years. Oh, it's not that simple. See, Niagara Falls is right here. It started off further north up by Lewiston. If the earth is millions of years old, why hasn't it eroded back to Lake Erie by now? Why is Niagara Falls right there? I have a theory about that, okay? Now, here's my theory. You see, about 6,000 years ago, God made everything, and 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that creek washed out in 20 minutes. So it looks like it took 9,900 years. They forgot the flood. They also forgot to get the right number. It should have been 8,400 had they used 4.7, but, you know, what do you expect? Okay. When it rains, 30% of the water runs into the ocean, bringing with it mineral salts. The oceans are getting saltier every day. Today, they're 3.6% salt. They could have done that in less than 5,000 years. Question, 
Why aren't the oceans saltier? Well, you see, 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there's a flood. Now, since the flood's been over, the oceans have gradually gotten saltier. One atheist I debated said, Hovind, could you please tell me how the freshwater fish survived the flood? I said, sir, aren't you assuming the flood was salt water? He said, the ocean is salt water. I said, well, it is today, yeah. During the flood, it's probably mostly fresh water, and it's gradually gotten saltier, and today some animals have had to adapt to salt water. And now we have freshwater crocodiles and saltwater crocodiles, and they probably had a common ancestor, a crocodile. He said, that's evolution. I said, no, it's not. Going from a freshwater croc to a saltwater croc is a minor change compared to your evolution story. You believe they changed from a rock to a croc. Now that's a major change, okay? A friend of mine in Alabama raises fish. He said he took a freshwater fish, black mollies, slowly added salt to their aquarium in two weeks. They became saltwater fish. When he put them back in fresh water, they died in 30 minutes. They can adapt to salt water, not a problem. How many have ever gone into a cave and the guide said, don't touch the formations, they take millions of years to form? They all got the same speech, right? You go over here to, uh, what's the one in Kentucky, uh, Mammoth Cave? Or go to Carlsbad Caverns and they say it took 250 million years. They did a study on these stalactites and one guy said, you know, the fastest they can grow is two and a half inches per thousand years. That's the maximum growth rate. I don't think so. Here are some 50 inch stalactites growing under the Lincoln Memorial. They did that in 40 years. There's a bat covered up with flowstone before it could even rot. There's two inch stalactites growing off refrigeration shed in Pensacola, Florida. There's a guy in a building in Indiana built just 40 years ago, has huge cave formations in the basement of the building from water leaking through the limestone. There's a mine was shut down in Australia for 55 years. When they opened it back up to check it out, there were huge cave formations in 55 years. There's a pipe that was dripping water for seven years, made a 13 inch stalactite. I thought it was two and a half inches per thousand years. It's more like two inches per year. They broke off the stalagmite that was under it and gave it to me. It's in my museum. There's a parking garage built 1997 in Texas. It was making stalagmites on the students' cars parking under it. They had to put up a drip pan to catch the water. A guy in Wyoming had a hot mineral spring on his property in Thermopolis, Wyoming. So he stuck a pipe in the ground. The water came out the top of the pipe and bubbled out the side of the top of the pipe, you know? But they had a little fountain. They called it the TP fountain. Well, the guy died. They left the pipe sticking in the yard. As the pipe was there, it, it left behind mineral deposits as the water evaporated. How many have seen these mineral deposits? You get them on your sink up here? Okay. The guy died, and uh, about uh, 95 years after, he died, after the pipe was stuck in the ground, I went to see it. Here it is, back in 1998. That would take some lime away to scrub that thing clean, don't you think? Yeah, a little bit. The guy down the street started his later. It's not quite as big, you know. But the, you know, at the current rate of erosion, the continents will erode flat in 14 million years. Why do they tell us we've got fossils that are 300 times older than that, still above sea level? They should have washed out to sea 300 times. All you got to do is fly out west and look at the erosion patterns and say, man, this place was destroyed by a flood. I mean, the whole world was destroyed by a flood. Just fly around like I do and look out the window once in a while. Uh, the oldest languages in the world are kind of interesting. Origin of major writing systems from National Geographic. What do they say? Well, they say the oldest writing systems in the world started about 3000 BC. 5,000 years ago, oldest writing systems. Hmm. And the oldest languages are modern, sophisticated, and complete. The Chinese said the year 2000 was the year 4700. They think they started their calendar with the flood. They called Noah Fuhai. The oldest recorded capital punishment 3,800 years ago. The Hebrew calendar said the year 2000 was 5760. We know the Hebrew calendar is messed up because the rabbi purposely took some years out to make it not match the prophecy to fit Jesus. The Saxons had a genealogy going back to Adam. The Danes and Norwegians had a king list going back to Noah. Don't trust the Egy Egyptian king list. That is greatly exaggerated. See the work by Corville on that in Evolution Cruncher. 
Why are the oldest reliable historical records less than 6,000 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. I bet you know what it is, don't you? Yeah. That Bible is absolutely right, folks. Absolutely correct, scientifically. The evidence for a young earth is overwhelming. The students aren't taught that. Students are only shown the evidence for an old earth. Remember the coins in the box? They better deal with the youngest ones, not the oldest ones. These books aren't really science books anymore. They're books about evolution. I think it's part of a much bigger picture for a new world order. See, the guys that started this country said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Like, do you have the right to have a church, or does the government create churches? It's the difference between 501c3 and 508c1a. You better study that out. You have the right to get married, or does the government give the right to get married? It's the difference between a marriage license and a marriage covenant. Big difference. Better study that out. But did you know 75% of kids from Christian homes who go to public schools will reject the Christian faith after one year of college? That's what happened to Crawford Toy. Most people have never heard of Crawford Toy, but he was a very famous Southern Baptist seminary professor. He almost married a girl named Lottie Moon. Has anybody ever heard of Lottie Moon? You know, you guys have the Lottie Moon offering every Christmas. She was a great missionary to China. Crawford Toy, after the Civil War, went to Europe and learned about evolution. And he sucked it in and believed it. He became an evolutionist. Crawford came back to his Bible class and said, you know, the Bible intends to teach a plain six-day creation. The Bible is simply an error at that point. The Bible's an error. Now, Crawford, hold on. Maybe your theory's an error. Maybe you got brainwashed. It's very easy to get brainwashed. I'm going to try to brainwash the whole crowd, and then we're going to quit and go home. And tomorrow we'll talk about the Garden of Eden. What was that like? Why did they live to be 900? But first I want to try to brainwash everybody. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you a little story. As I tell the story, I will brainwash you. Maybe you've never been brainwashed before. It's a harmless procedure. Don't worry about it, okay? When I'm done telling the story, I will ask you two simple questions about the story. If you know the answer, I just want you to raise your hand, okay? If you don't know the answer, it will be because you have been successfully brainwashed. Now pay attention. Here goes the story. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? If you know, raise your hand, but don't say it out loud. It's about five or six. Ooh, okay, the rest of you, pay attention. We're going to try it again. Okay. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint. That's important. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Anybody new figured out? Two more. Okay. The rest of you, pay attention. We're going to try it one more time. But now I'm going to unbrainwash you. So you didn't realize it, but I had you brainwashed in the first three seconds. I'm going to unbrainwash all of you now just by showing you a couple of pictures. I'll tell the same story word for word, but watch the pictures. You will feel yourself get unbrainwashed. It's the coolest feeling. Are you ready? Here goes. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men? <laughs> Look at you in the umpire. You say, uh, Brother Hovind, is it that easy to get brainwashed? Oh, yeah. You see, as soon as I said a man left home, you started thinking about a house, and you were off track. And once you get off track, it's pretty tough to get back on. Would you like to see how kids get brainwashed in your school system by the millions every year? 
Millions of kids in America every single year get brainwashed, and it's so simple how they do it. They put the kid in kindergarten. He can't even read yet. And they give him a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to just take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? <laughs> Millions of years ago. And that kid's being thrown off track in the first five seconds. How many kids are being taught that in your town? Like all of them. That's calling Jesus a liar. Did dinosaurs live millions of years ago? Dr. Seuss even says it millions of years before you were born. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Huh, somebody's wrong, folks. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says before the flood came, they lived to be 900 years old. How is that possible? Well, we'll cover that in seminar part two tomorrow. But uh, what about the flood? Well, that's covered on video number six. And what about dinosaurs? Well, that's covered on video number three. But listen, you're going to be told in school, you started like a slime and you slowly became a human. You be careful because that philosophy will spoil you. Jesus said, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of the world and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Hey, if a child goes 12 to 16 years to school in your town, how's he going to view the world? Probably as an evolutionist. Hey, if the Bible's right about the beginning, maybe it's right about the end. Mm -hmm. Let's summarize here. God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules, and we are all guilty of breaking his rules. Every one of us. I'll show you. Here's the Ten Commandments. He told us, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Put your hand up. Come on. You're doing another one if you don't. Okay. All right. Thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Come on, you already told me you're a liar. Put your hand up, okay? <laughs> Keep your hand go up there, brother. Put it up. Okay. All right, so far we know we're all a bunch of lying thieves, right? Do you want to read the whole list and see how we're doing? <laughs> we better stop right there. There's no question we are guilty and we are going to be punished. God is a righteous judge. He cannot look upon sin and we're going to be punished. Or you need to find a substitute. That's where Jesus comes in. He wants to pay for your sins. 36 years ago, I told him he could pay for mine. I asked him to forgive me and save me. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? Smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> where are you going when you die? Hmm? You ought to think about that because you're going to be dead for a really long time. All you get in this life is a little bitty dash between two dates. I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. Hey, it could happen today. Have you seen the way they drive around Knoxville, Tennessee? You have got some certified rednecks out there, folks, and you can get killed on the way home tonight, right? Where are you going when you die? If you're not sure you're saved, why don't you ask the Lord to forgive you and save you? And if you are saved, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Everybody ought to find something to do for the Lord. There's a war going on. Find something to do, okay? Get busy. Win souls. Be a Sunday school teacher. Bus driver. Do something for God with your life. If we can help, that's what our materials are for. Catalog on the back table back there, as well as our videos. We want to help strengthen your faith in God's Word. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. 
And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, If you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA. Or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.